That's right. Let me get up on stage and get a podium here. Well, that is a podium. Does anyone have a homebrew project that I have not talked to and gotten your name, call, and what it is? I kind of implicitly put you down there. Okay. Okay. Um, you're okay to go at the end? I'll just get you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. For those who've never seen Homebrew Night before, join the club. I haven't either. So this will be a learning experience. From what I understand from talking to everybody, though, I think I kind of understand what it's supposed to be. The first project we have this evening is from Eugene Hecker, K, or excuse me, WB5CCF. Hey, there's no seven in that call. And he has, an, I didn't get all of it, he has an antenna project he'd like to show us. I volunteered to take part in the Days of 47 Parade, and they wanted me to have a station there on uh, 2nd East and 2nd West, I mean 2nd South. And uh, so I built up this little unit here to help my, my transmitter get out better power. But the only thing is they put in a great big broadcasting station right in back of me with two great big speakers, and they broadcasted music or talked all the time. And I had my earphone on. I think I must have pushed it through my ear trying to hear the net what was going on. But they was able to hear me, but I couldn't hear them. But this is the little antenna right here. <laughs> you take a piece of RG58 cable, and you strip off the insulation. Don't peel it all the way off. Then you push your insulation, your shield down, and then you take a nail and pull that braid off. And you put that back on the insulation and tape that up so you've got a full wave antenna here. And it works very well. And the thing of it is, if you want to center load it, you can curl it up like that. Or if you want to make it crooked or anything like this, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and as a uh, prize or for participating, we have this beautiful blowtorch for you. See me? And I understand this is a fairly popular item. So it's a pencil torch. And that's yours. And I've been told to instruct everyone. I will. You'll get these at, at after the end of your presentation. If you don't get it tonight, you forego all all claim to such item. Because from what I understand, there's people who try to track down the item months later. and So you have to get it here tonight or you're not getting it at all, basically, is the... Thank you. Next, we have Mike, K7CF, who has a noise buster, as he calls it, from a QST project. So Mike? Sure. Go ahead. Hmm? Sure, no problem. Oh, okay. How many of you have, uh, by the way, I am a member. You just don't see me much because I work uh, a lot of nights and uh, weekends, and, and they got a kibosh on overtime, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but it pays for a lot of toys. But how many of you have power line noise? Raise your hand. Oh, boy. Well, you guys pay attention. Don't fall asleep. I'm going to check. Okay, first of all, this was a little article in, uh, in QST magazine that came out. <clears throat> now, I have to preface this story because I started five years ago working with UPNL, me and uh, W6JR, who is now deceased, uh, W6NZX, and we worked with UPNL to try and discover why we had so much power line noise. I read everything there was on power line noise. I became a local power line nut. I'd go out in the middle of the night and I'd be walking up and down the power lines with my antennas with, these loop, uh, with a current loop and a shortwave receiver, and they knew who I was. I was the guy with all the antennas, you see. But anyway, I was trying to find out where this stinking noise was, and what happened was basically is the lightning hit, and when the lightning hit, I had this tremendous noise, and I could actually see it on an oscilloscope, and it was there, it was a spike. I lived near a power, uh, a power substation, and it was driving me crazy. I, you know, and naturally pointed right toward Europe. You know, I couldn't hear diddly squat. So anyway, working with the power lines people, and they, after they spent a hundred and some thousand dollars, and you know what's amazing, when those guys come out, is it Morley here? <laughs> K7UM, are you here? 
Okay, well anyway, when those guys come out here, they bring about 10 guys and three trucks and four booms and all that stuff. No wonder it costs so much money. But uh, they, did a, they did a super job, by the way. You just have to hang in there. After 175 phone calls, you can just, you know, eventually they show up. But anyway, along with that, they did find it. And I might add, it turned out to be a, a lightning arrestor that was a mile and a half away, an $8 lightning arrestor that was, uh, and the way those things work, you know, when you, in your house you have a transformer, you have a fuse, and you have a lightning arrestor. And this lightning arrestor had popped off. It's got a little charge in it. And instead of having a gap that wide, it had a gap that wide. And it was sounded like it was sending Morse code. And, you know, eventually we found it. He found it by taking a ball-peen hammer up there and hitting on the pole, you know, and, ah, there it was, you know, he actually saw it, right? <laughs> well, then he told me about it, and it disappeared, and I went back up there with an aluminum ball bat. And of course, the neighbors think I'm a little weird anyway. <laughs> so I get up there with, the, ball, with the, the aluminum ball bat, and I start banging on this thing to try and bring it back, and it wouldn't come back. If you ever want to see this pole, you'll notice it, it's the one that looks like a golf ball. <laughs> you know. But anyway, so, you know, along with that, I had a quest to get rid of my noise. So I came across this article in, in July 1994 QST, and it really wasn't a very professional type of thing. It said the noise steerer revisited. And where, what he has here is he was bragging about how you could take two antennas and steer them and phase them so you could listen to, say, a broadcast. Say you, had a, you were listening on the broadcast frequencies and you wanted to listen to a station in Chicago, but on the same frequency you had a a radio station in San Francisco, you know, like 690 on the dial. Well, you could actually take two antennas and phase them and cancel out the noise in the opposite direction and hear the station in Chicago, even though San Francisco's closer. And I said, well, gee, if you can phase out a radio station, guess what? You can probably phase out noise. Well, I wrote the guy. Well, actually, I didn't write him until after I built it. And anyway, <laughs> and I was saying, wow, this thing really works good, and it does work good. Now, the... And this is what it looks like. It looks kind of like that. And I took his cue. I used all these, these uh, things here. And naturally, there was nothing like this available on the market. I tried the QEM, SEM, Q, QRM eliminator from England. You know, a guy sent it to me. But in England, they don't know how to make potentiometers very well. They're all scratchy. Or either that, they pour sand in them before they get here. You know, I couldn't hear much. <laughs> but anyway, this, uh, this thing here I built, and actually I built two of them. And it's all homebrew. You can't, you can't, there's nothing like it. There's really nothing like it. And W6XC is pretty good. You know, and for years I had a, a grid dip uh, oscillator, and I never used it. But I had the chance here, because you see, you have to wind your own coils. And uh, taking Dow, uh, 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 Dow pins and, uh, and, and taking wire and wrapping it on there was a really a fun little project. Getting all the coils and the switch and all that sort of thing. Getting 200 ohm potentiometers. And the only thing commercial in this thing was a kit, and that's a an automatic uh, antenna switchover relay that uh, allows you to transmit through this device. <coughs> and actually, I have it uh, one device that has the ability to hook up two transceivers at the same time so I can select between them. But basically, this thing, I can, I can knock down noise from 20 dB down to S5, depending on what it is. Or I can use it as a null steering device and knock out uh, uh, electrical noise or static, say, coming in from a southwest storm or, say, long path into the Pacific. Uh, this device will actually do that. And it's, it was a fun project, and I recommend if anybody really wants to get serious about eliminating your noise, you try this guy out. I think, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think this device will really, really help oh, yeah, in yeah. Getting, getting rid of the pole. Ooh, wow. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Next we have ah. Uh, oh, this is uh, there's a there's a good story behind this one. Eugene, I'll tell you. This is why we did so well on field day, right here. Uh, next we have Eugene KC7CSE, who has a vertical to show us uh, along with his homemade battery case. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this story starts back in February at uh, Utah VHF Society swap meet. I had an extra Yesu FT2400H2 meter mobile rig, and I was looking for a 
two-beater all-mode rig. There was two available. When I found out about them, they were gone. And then later on, uh, there was a supply of these showed up. Uh, this is a military surplus HF vertical antenna. It's all stainless steel from the base all the way up. It's telescopic. I mean, it will not come apart accidentally. It has, it will go up 35 feet or any increment you want there. And then there is a, the feed point is a big nut underneath here. You got an insulating bushing here and then another insulating bushing down below that protects your uh, feed point. The feed point comes through right up into this here uh, base right here. And then it uh, extends from here on up. These are 10 foot black Dacron polyester guy lines connected onto here. This part right here is a locking ring. And on the back side of that, you notice there's one on each one of them for, to, you can run it up, you can twist it over there. It's a knurled ring. You can lock it with your hand. Then you take a couple of uh, uh, nut drivers. There's a jam nut behind here that locks the locking ring. And then there's another jam nut that locks the jam nut. So when you get it up to where you want, it's going to stay there. Now, at field day, I, we had three of these available. I got one of them. I paid $50 for it, and then uh, I traded off my extra two-meter rig and plug, got this plus some cash. And uh, the club president, Alan Seabolt, got one for himself and one for the club. So we had three of them up there. I and mean, Tom Schaefer worked together a way of uh, putting together uh, phase vertical. So we used two of these, put up a full length. In the meantime, I'd had a, a steel base plate made, which you see down here. This is had it galvanized because I figured that's the best way to prevent the rust on it. Made out of quarter inch steel plate. And they threw, uh, through Rolf, uh, you know, KC7 uh, HPA, who's a machinist, he had a welding friend that cut these things here with a laser. Don't ask me what kind of laser it was, but no acetylene torch could cut holes as smooth as this did. There wasn't a sliver of metal on it. So uh, down below there's uh, 16 ground radials that'll go out 15 feet. That's what all these here nuts are for, I should say bolts, that are uh, drilled in and uh, stuck in the bottom there. And then I put this, uh, uh, incidentally from what I was told there, between the two antennas that the, the club put up at, uh, at the field day, this one which was uh, one half of the phase verticals, and then the other one, Tom, what was that? Uh, some kind of three wire dipole or what it was you're trying to put? It worked all right. It done a wonderful job of raising holy havoc with international broadcast frequencies on 40 meters. <laughs> but we tried. But this one worked perfect there. And of course, we had wires scattered all over the place. But. Uh, You'll see down here in this box here is uh, courtesy of, uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. Uh, yeah, is one half of a 20 cell gel cell pack that comes out of portable x ray equipment. And they have a, you know, a, whole, uh, a whole stack of these batteries. Each one of them is uh, approximately six volts and it's rewired for 12 volts. And this pack here, fully charged, will carry the equivalent of 100 ampere hours of power at 12 volts. This one right here first ran my, uh, my HF station. 
and my two meter mobile station or two meter base station for uh, five weeks not 24 hours a day that's on CW voice or phone on the on the HF rig and then the phone on the two meter rig before it finally dropped down to 11 volts and by taking a chance I found out that my regulated power supply is does a wonderful job of recharging this thing because I can control both the voltage and the current going into it. Now there's uh, this is four rods I made. They're made out of an eight foot length of five eighths each ground rod and they go in a hole down here a one inch hole here and that anchors the base plate in place and we drive you drive each one in at a different angle so that way the base plate can't move on you needless to say uh, the field day site had their share of rocks and that was no problem getting these in. I had a, my single jack hammer. I left it at home. You always, you always got to leave something home. They'd done a good job of driving these in, so he had about that much sticking out. So he got about 20 inches of steel in the ground, down in between, crowded in between rocks and what have you. So everything was fine until come time to take it down. The standard way to get these out is to hit him with a hammer up here and jar them loose. But if you look at this hole later on here, these rods are in like this, each one at a different angle. There's no room for this rod to maneuver how to get it out back to the toolbox. Power channel locks should say vice grips. Put in here about two inches above the ground level. And then a block, a block of wood. I brought this because it's convenient. The two before work out also. You lay it down here like so, like here. What you what you're doing is you're employing the principles of uh, cribbing. And then a bar. If this is not long enough, get a longer one. You put the bar in like this here and pry up. You want to make sure that if this, uh, if this rod is facing this angle here, put your bar in on the side. Otherwise, you're going to be prying into this base plate. Unless you drive this rod into a six inch root, it will come out. There wasn't a rock at the field day site that could hold it. And there were many. <laughs> Are there any any questions with respect to this that it'll be here for people to look at afterwards? Yes, uh, it goes up to 35 feet. There is a totally collapsed Excuse me. It's about right to here. Everything telescopes down into the lower section. It will not come apart accidentally. It's made uh, so that you, even if uh, if it falls out, I mean lengthwise, it can only go out the the length of these different sections. And so about uh, well, I guess about about seven feet with the base on on the on it there. Although it can telescope down accidentally if you don't have it tight enough. Your fingers will realize that quick. All right, Eugene, here you go. Thank you very much. Just, just to let you how, how, know how well those worked, at about 1 o'clock I started Sunday morning. I guess it was Sunday morning? Yeah, 1 o'clock Sunday morning I went out to the CW station, bundled up, you know, something I wasn't accustomed to for field aid being from Florida. And um, bundled up and sat at the CW station, and we had the phase verticals running. And they were pointing, I guess, about northeast or due, I'm sorry, east. 
And I just sat there on one frequency on 40 meters until dawn and called CQ and had people answer me. So they were, uh, they were marvelous antennas. Okay. Unlike the 80 meter beam, which, or wire beam, which was another story for those that were there. And I'm really, Eugene, I'm really amazed that copper didn't get any fluorescent tape on it. I didn't think I missed anything. Okay. Next we have Linda, N7HVF, who's going to tell us about a timer, a uh, speech timer she has. Okay, you want me to bring it over to you? <laughs> tell me what I need to do. Oh, go ahead. Okay, this piece of equipment I got because I was really frustrated. <laughs> and I had, um, if you remember, I did a, um, on the Women Allowed program on KRCL, I um, did a program on women in amateur radio and they aired it and it went off really good. Well, this year I did one on uh, my friend Terry and she, um, it does her own jingles and um, anyway they were going to air it on Sunday when I was going to be in church and I was kind of frustrated and I thought you know I wish I could get something that I could set that a blind person could use to set a timer to go off because I had a radio but I had to get someone that could see to help me set it and my roommate Pauline didn't like to help me and her boyfriend helped me fix it up, but still I wanted something that I could do and I wouldn't have to ask anybody. So I called this innovative um, thing in California that sells stuff for blind people and he told me about it and I got it. And it's called a stat timer and we'll let you hear how it sounds. adjust volume and adjust settings. Generally press buttons once for current settings. Press again within two seconds to alter. Okay. You can set it to go off. If you want it to go off, you can set it to go off. Like if you want it to go off at 12.30, you can set it. And you, what you do is you hook it up, you can plug it into your radio. You hook it up through your, it plugs into your system and it'll automatically turn your radio on if it, to go off at 12.30 or whenever you set it. And you have to set how long you want it to stay on and then it'll go off by itself. And so it, it, they call it a time stat because you can also set it up to electric blanket if you want your electric to blanket to go off at a certain time. <laughs> I've never done that, but <laughs> anyway, um, that's what it does. It does have a... And it's, it's really neat and it has a, it tells you the temperature. I've never messed with the temperature because it tells you in what centigrades or whatever. I don't understand all that stuff. And um, so it's a really neat device. And if a blind person is interested in that way, they can hook it up and it'll record a program on your radio or whatever you, I guess you could even hook it up to the TV if you wanted. So anyway, that's what it is. <laughs> hey, thank you. Do you want a blowtorch? Put it here, here. There you go. We got something else. That's <laughs> pretty funny. Got it? Okay. Thank you, Linda. Uh, next we have. Oh, for anyone who's just come in or came in recently, if anyone has a homebrew project that they haven't talked to me so I can get your name just at the end, let me know and we'll have you come up, okay? Steve. Next we have our good friend Steve, KC7IAS, 
who is going to show us his, I called it the House of Mouse. That would be Mickey Mouse. That would be a copyright problem. We don't want to... Everybody knows I'm the one for the job on Mickey Mouse. Um, yeah, I'm the comic relief. After all these serious projects, mine's the comic relief. After, uh, well, no, I think I'll be okay. Unless anybody knows Moore's code, I don't. <laughs> um, after you've spent uh, the, the two thousand dollars for your uh, for your uh, new HF rig, and you're out of money, and you want to you want to get on the ROCW, you realize you can't afford that paddle that you wanted. Um, my my reason I built it was because of Phil Day. Uh, I uh, took my nice uh, MFJ knockoff of a bencher paddle up there and promptly dropped it, and it took me a half an hour just to get it back together. I didn't want to do that again, uh, so I, I built this. It's uh, <clears throat> everybody has the a dead mouse laying around the house, and I, I built me a, a paddle out of a, out of a mouse. It's just normal. This is a, a Mitsubishi mouse. And it also is an old mouse, so I've noticed that the dot is uh, sticking a little. So if uh, and I am a tech, so that's another or tech plus. So that's another reason why if I if I mess up when I'm sending this, you'll know it's either the mouse or me, one of the two. Let's see if this is loud enough. Said I'm a tech, so tech plus, so you know this is not going to be at 20 words a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have your obligatory blowtorch. Thank you, Steve. And the next trick is to get for those with laptops to be able to use the the mouse embedded in the keyboard. Just rip the laptop apart, you know. Okay, next we have Chuck. Gee, there seems to be a pattern to this order. I don't know when this WA7JOS, who's going to show us a cigarette lighter charger, or subtitled "How to Save Yourself 50 Bucks." That's me. I'm cheap. <laughs> okay, where'd it go? There we are. Got buried here. Okay, this was about a one-hour project. Just uh, buy yourself a cigarette lighter plug at Radio Shack or wherever. And on the other end, you uh, put the connector for your HT, whatever fits. And then you take the plug apart and you do a little modification. And this uses an LM317 regulator. But instead of the traditional method that most of you are probably familiar with for a constant voltage output, this is a constant current output. And the little paper here has the schematic if you want to come and look af afterwards. But it's set at 50 milliamps, and it'll charge anything at 50 milliamps. One cell, two cells, eight cells, doesn't matter. You put an ammeter across, it charges 50 milliamps. And uh, so uh, as long as the input voltage is at least 1.2 volts higher than what you need for the output, it'll charge. And uh, um, that's it. When I'm out tooling around and my HT needs charged, I don't need to find a current bush to take care of that. Thank you, Chuck. Here's your blowtorch. Thank you. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. 
Okay. Next we have Eugene in 7 OVT with his, let's see, where is it? It's up here somewhere. Oh, here it is. This is his uh, satellite of color. <laughs> Working demo. And by coincidence, there's a satellite overhead right now. There actually is. So the edge of the panel shut off. There's no light to turn it on. What we got here is a 440 satellite tracking antenna. And we build them as quads or round or however you want to go with it. But it works on the 440. Uh, 439,860? No, no, 439,800. 436,800. Let's get back to, you yeah, okay. And what you do with that is we use for AO, AO27 satellite, and you pull off internet your information on when it's going to go by and where it's going to go by, and you go out and track it. Start following it from, what, Steve? Uh, yeah. It actually, it, can, it, can, it actually works as a repeater from the satellite. So you're listening off from the 440 band and uh, talking on, on the uh, two meter band. So you have to have either a dual band or two radios to play with it. But it's, uh, it does work very well. It also works as a uh, 440 beam or quad. So it, it does work very well. In fact, my first contact with this one was Canada. So it does, uh, does do a pretty good job. Could you uh, could you explain exactly what the color, how the color changes the RF uh, radiation patterns? Different, you know. I mean, it makes it a little bit longer or shorter depending on what color you use. Actually, it's like 12 foot wire, so I mean, 12 gauge wire, so it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. Just for the fun of it. And you. You can use it for sporadic R when a rainbow comes out. Thank you, Eugene. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's right, I forgot. Eugene has a couple more things. I didn't like having to uh, put my HT where I couldn't get a hold of it anymore, where I could, couldn't see it. So I went down to Delby's Plastic and picked up some some of their scrap plastic, and you bend them into this kind of a situation, and they work very well for an HD holder. If you have a long HT, you use it that way. If you have a short one, you turn it over and use it the other way. But they work very well. In fact, if anybody's interested afterwards, come up and talk to me. I brought six of them tonight. So if you're interested in one of them, come up and talk to me after the meeting. I also have one more plaything that uh, was put together earlier. Uh, those of you who have handhelds with rubber ducts, rubber attenuators, let's put it that way, uh, it's very easy to make a quarter wave antenna. Take a PL259 by the adapter and put you, if you got an old CB antenna, or actually just a piece of uh, uh, welding rod or something like that, 19 inches long, or check it out for, for lengthwise on your two meter band, you can make a very, very easy to make a quarter wave antenna that will go on your HT. I put a BNC adapter on, on the uh, PL259 along with it. so that it will fit on the HT. They work about 100 times better than your uh, rubber duck antennas. So that's another uh, easy idea that a person could do if you want to do that. We use uh, just an epoxy glue to glue the uh, wire into it. So it works very well though. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hmm? Oh, question, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, everybody who's come, no, wait, 
everybody who's coming in is going at the end, okay? Wait, no, not yet. Not yet. I, I have a list, okay? okay? Let me know when you're ready. Sure will. All right. I'm going late. I'll wait for it. Thanks. Eugene. How did you uh, I got that in the Delby too. Delby plastic. On about, on about uh, 24 south and 24. They have a very good scrap bin. <laughs> Outside? No, it's inside. Oh. <laughs> 20 after? 25 after. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, <laughs> okay, thank you, Eugene. Our next project presenter is Dick Bell, W7TGC, who's going to show us a 30 meter exciter. It's to demonstrate that uh, homebrew doesn't have to look good to work good. This looks pretty clubby as you can see, but it works great. And it's uh, just about all out of the junk box and was a lot of fun. The, uh, the VFO is a VXO, so it's uh, naturally stable and uh, had a few remarks too when they find out you're operating a uh, homebrew rig well they say my it's stable uh, like they didn't expect that anyway it's very stable and using a high frequency crystal in it so uh, we can bend that crystal uh, quite a ways enough to cover the CW portion of the, the uh, 30 meter band then we follow it with uh, an amplifier, builds it up 60 watts. But the thing uh, works fine, had no trouble with it. We've had it for four years, I guess. And uh, Eugene talked me into bringing it today. <laughs> Any questions? Good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, Gordon. How much range do you get out of the VXO? Didn't hear you. How much range do you get from the VXO? Oh, about 25k hertz, okay. which is just right. Maybe a little less. <laughs> Keep us in band. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, you do. Thank you, Dick. Very nice. Wait a minute, let me see something. I didn't even get a chance to see this. Oh, okay. And uh, I think everybody will have their projects up here at the end so we can all take a look and take stuff home and, you know, oh, don't do that, don't do that. Interesting project. I, I had a preview of this. It was, uh, it's uh, deceivingly uh, good, I guess is the best way to put it. Craig, KC7UIX. Who's got a J pole and a surprise? Where's Craig? I'm used to talking to people, <laughs> but uh, what I did is uh, when I first got with uh, him, when I got my permit or my tag, I thought I got to get into this real crazy with building stuff, and so I bought a book that had antennas in it because I'm kind of interested in building antennas. And after cutting up about 200 feet of um, of uh, antenna wire, the double strand wire, and finding out I'm no good at building antennas, I about give up the whole idea. And then somebody walked into the uh, radio shop down here with a antenna they'd made out of coax. And I thought, well, you know, I got about 300 feet of coax. <laughs> so, so I went home and after about 50 feet or 60 feet of coax, I come up with a with an antenna, and uh, it actually <laughs> it actually worked, which uh, was so neat. I went over next door and called my neighbors to come over and said, "Look at this! I made an antenna, and I hoisted it up the side of my house with fish line and hooked it to the top of my uh, fireplace antenna, or uh, antenna fireplace stack." and hooked my radio up to it, and it just uh, worked incredibly good. I was really tickled. So I put it on my CB uh, SWR meter, and it come out to be about a one and one and a half, and I, I, I guess that's good. I don't know. It's hard to tell, because I had the wrong SWR meter, but 
it worked, and I don't really know what I'm doing, so I can't tell you how I did it. <laughs> but I built another one just like it, and it worked too. So I kept the measurements and everything, so I can do it again if I copy that. And then my wife had an assignment to uh, run a coax through the house for our TV set to get it into a room that I just built and wasn't bright enough to put the coax in the wall before I got the sheetrock up. <laughs> well, uh, I ran the coax, was fine. I got it down along the duck entry and, and I got the coax about where I needed it. And I was lucky because it actually dropped off and went down in the wall. I went downstairs and drilled a quarter inch hole through the wall and got a piece of coat hanger and tried to snag that stupid wire. I don't know if you've ever tried that before, but after about 30 minutes I'd had all I could take. And so I got up and kicked a hole through the wall <laughs> and I could reach right through with my hand and grab it. it. And it was really neat, but I had to plug the hole. So then I got this idea and I thought there's got to be a light that I can put through a hole so I can see inside the wall. There isn't. And when I finally found one, Snap-on does sell one. It's about $45 and I'm very cheap. That's about $43 more than I want to spend. <laughs> so I went down to uh, Pet Boys and found a flashlight there with about a six inch tail on it and a great big knob on the end of it. And I'm thinking this is kind of silly. I mean, they make lights already with a light bulb on it. You know, why put a tail on it if you can't do anything with it? So I went home and cut it off. A brand new flashlight, whacked it right off there in front of my wife. And she says, something's wrong here. You know, you said, why did you do that? And I said, because I'm going to make a long wire on it and put a light bulb at the very end of it. Then I can drill a quarter inch hole, stick it through the quarter inch hole, and look through that hole. If you've ever tried to hold a flashlight up and look through something, it's impossible. But I can put this inside the wall and it literally lights up the whole inside of the wall and you can see everything there is through a quarter inch hole. And the way it works is uh, like this. And it is very bright and it works really well. You can put it in computers. I do a lot of work on motors and uh, drives for uh, machinery and stuff. And if you're looking to see if the brushes are okay, rather than tearing the whole motor apart, you can just stick this through one of the opened ends on the motors and you can usually see the brushes very well with it because it illuminates the inside of the vehicle where you can look inside and see everything. Works great under a dashboard. If you've ever put radios or wiring under a dash and you've had to lay on your back trying to hold a flashlight or put one of those silly things on your head, crazy. You can stick this right up there, lay it on the wiring, and let go of it and it lights everything up underneath your dash and you can see everything you're doing very well. At night it works really good if you drop something behind a chair or something. So I thought that was kind of cute and people might want to see it. But that's all I've got. There you go. Thank you, that was great. Oh uh, gosh. Okay, uh, Clint, do you just want to go last or you want to go now or it's up to you? Last hour, okay, that's perfect. Okay, next we have, um, we're going to start in the end. Uh, we have Robert KB7, K, excuse me, KB707 is hard for me to say. KB7GSE with, I'm not quite sure, I think it has something to do with the helmet. Again, if anybody uh, hasn't signed up, just, you know, at, at the end, just bring, bring your stuff up. Got a helmet like this. Now the helmet, the color doesn't matter. It just has to be orange. I got one home that's yellow and the other that's white. Put a put a jack on the top right here. Put one right here. And then run your wire through there. Now I take this here and I run this one through here. <laughs> this is the two meter antenna. Now the next step is this. Which will run this on the particular run this down here. Now I have the cord that goes from here. You know those RF guideline questions? Ignore them right now. Now uh, this goes down here. I'll put this on my head. Now 
Now, now this cord here uh, plugs into the radio. Now watch now as I'll let you watch this now as I uh, turn the switch on. I hook this on there and I'm hands free and I'll watch the, watch the meter. See, you see, I went all the way out. KB, this is the KB7. Where's my... You want to use that one for this one? Yeah, this is the, the KB7 GSC testing. One, two, three, four test, four, three, two, one test. And, uh, and, and this clips down to here, and this goes into my pouch, and I'm hands-free on, uh, on the radio, and, and I look like a robot. <laughs> now, on the second demonstration, <laughs> I haven't got I haven't got the hat on. I'll put the antenna on there. Now on this one, on this one here, you got to make sure that your mic element is the right impedance. If it's the wrong impedance, then you've got trouble. So you can you can get these at any of the stores. Need these helmets, and it's got to. Now, when I'm plugging in using excess batteries, make sure your polarities are right. If you hook your black to your positive plus and your red to your negative minus, four things is going to happen. Number one, you're going to blow the diode. Number two, you're going to pop the transistor. Number three, uh, the lit literally smoke. And number four, you burned up the first stage and wrecked the unit. Unfortunately, I had insurance on this radio because I, I did it one time by mistake. <laughs> now, now the second demonstration that gets you a, a phone that looks like this. You can get these at the Deseret Industries anywhere or Savers, and and get your cord that uh, come, looks like this, and it comes off of a, a, an old mic, and you plug your cord in here, which goes right here. Now, the next step, you have to go to Radio Shack, you have to buy a plug that fits like this, and you have to have a switch, because it comes in closed position, which puts you in transmitting. When you want to receive, you've got to put the switch in and open it for receiving. Now, this goes here. Now, when I push this here, uh, uh, now, now watch the meter. Uh-oh. <laughs> put this back in here. Now we'll, now we'll walk. Wait a minute, see if I got turned on. I got it hooked up right there. Let's see, this is. Let's turn that. It is plugged all the way in. No. Turn it on. I got it plugged in. I got it hooked in now. Now I'm okay. Uh, KB7 GS testing, one, two, three, four test, four, three, two, one test. Wait a minute, I gotta go back one here. I'm on the uh, six, two, one. Oh, there we go. One, two, three, four test, four, three, two, one test, KB7 GSC testing. And, and I've used one of these all through my Hammond career, and it's worked very effectively with me, and I haven't had any problem with them. These are simple to build up. So that's what you've got to make sure that the mic element in here is the right impedance. If it isn't, you're, you're, you're going to have trouble because it isn't going to work. Now, also, I got boxes of something like these, and I built up at home, and I got four, four jacks, one's got eight jacks, and I can, I can uh, uh, charge four or eight lead as the gel cell batteries or the NICAP batteries, but you want to make sure that all your plus goes one way and all your minus goes the opposite way. If you intermix them, then you're going to have trouble. You could burn something up, cause an explosion, blow something up, or, or, or do some damage. It blows up your face. You, uh, you might never see it again. You don't know. And the last item here, this here is one of the older ones they use uh, for taping. It's got a transformer in there. comes off a 6AQ5, a condenser and a resistor. And you plug in, in into here, and you come off your output of your radio or your television, which is 8 ohms. And then you come over on the other side, which is 5 or 10,000 ohms. And you plug right into your tape recorder that has these high high impedances. And you match it right up, and you tape everything beautiful. So this, uh, this is, is my demonstration. And I am KB7 GSE. Uh, General Primary, Robert Schofield, or Utah, and thanks a million, and that's all from here. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Portable.
There's your torch. Thank you. That's very good. And this this does. I, as I was watching it, as you you do push to talk. It's I, I think we heard come the other way around, but you do push to talk. Yeah. You have to have the button in there because you have to it'll be in transmit position and you have to open the circuit to put it in receive so yeah uh, so you have to have that button in there because you have to open the circuit when you receive and close the circuit when you transmit if you don't you'll just be in transmit position that would make it easier to transmit for a long time well, you get these at and, and the cord too but you got to get uh, this plug and, and this jack that goes in here okay. All right. 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 both of this one and this one here you have to blame with radio shaft. Okay. Thank you. So uh, make sure uh, you get the right the right parts. If you don't, uh, you're going to run into some problems. And 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 I don't mean maybe. I mean in big capital letters. All right, Robert. Thank you very much. You can, you can just leave this up here if you like, and people can take a look at it. If you want to just leave it up here, and people can take a look at it at the end. Okay. All right. And here, go ahead and take this. I can't let you leave without this. Here, just take that, and we'll just leave this up here so people can take a look at it. That's a poor little pencil torch. torch? Yeah. Okay, thanks a million. Thank you. Take care. Let's see. Next we have Garth, K7MHN, who has, is he uh, set up? We're set up. He's got a beam. Otherwise known as I'll climb anything. <laughs> and I'll rub it in. I'm going to do that Saturday too. Um, this is a seven element two meter beam. It's uh, made out of completely out of uh, uh, TV antenna parts, except for the aluminum coax or the aluminum uh, conduit, which I have down the middle. The only reason I used it was because the the boom that I had from the antennas that I had collected were not long enough and I didn't want to take the time to splice two of them together. But um, everything basically came out of my junk garage. <laughs> it's my... Yeah, I know. Our <laughs> yeah, so um, that's because it's missing radials on the uh, TV antenna. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I uh, uh, I was going to borrow a uh, walking uh, beam from my brother-in-law last year for field day. Decided uh, the morning that I was going up, since I couldn't get a hold of him to get it, that I needed to make something because my wife was off to uh, one of the youth camps that summer, and uh, my kid, two of my kids were going with her, and the other two were going with me, and we were going to try to get together and talk uh, with one another, uh, third party, but. Uh, so I decided at the last minute to throw this thing together, and uh, from the field day, field day uh, site uh, on 10 watts, had no problem kerchunking most of the repeaters around, so they worked out real well. Um, by the way, the plans for this uh, came from one of the uh, magazines that I get in the mail, so that's where it was built. Yeah, question. Okay, um, yeah, I, I just drilled uh, holes straight through that direction, uh, just slipped the radials through and then uh, put a screw through from the other side that goes in far enough to hit the actual uh, radials. Uh, no. Yeah, it's, they're... Uh, some of these, well, I think I dr drilled a pilot hole, if I remember correctly. I drilled the, the one on the outside to be pretty much the same size as the screw, but then I may have popped a, a pilot on the inside. Any other questions? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> um, I can't remember what they said the gain was on it. Um, but like I say, I didn't have any problem hitting most of the repeaters I needed to at that point. Yeah. Yeah, gamma match. A lot of fun to play with. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Okay, the, the, ins the outside piece is a piece of radial off the TV antenna. The inside piece is a clear center, uh, and it's the conductor and the center core out of a coax. Okay? And then basically you uh, connect the center piece onto the center of your uh, 259 or uh, SO 239 and uh, the uh, strap, it, you know, it works as a capacitor on the, on the gamma. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Garth. Can you make one of those for 20? I don't mean theoretically, I mean literally. Could you make one of them? <laughs> you have to find a big TV There you go. Okay. Next we have, last but not least, I think. No, not last but not least. No, no, not yet, not yet. Yeah, whatever was right before that. Leland Christensen, KC7PVF. Um, very inexpensive. And it's uh, very durable because you can put it in your bag and then you put your batteries on top of it and then you can still use it. So put that underneath there. You can kind of straighten things out again. And I believe it's working okay. And then what's nice about it is it's made with a uh, barrel here. So you can screw that on a piece of an old PC board, saw to your um, aerials, your ground reflectors here and bend them out about 45 and straighten them out as much as you need to and then you can take your other piece and put it back on top here and then you can uh, use either a short piece of coax or longer and you can put it up on the house uh, on a stick or shovel or anything tree so you can get it to work so it's it's very portable very useful um, it's just an old piece of uh, coax had the uh, um, center conductor and everything there and so you just strip off all the um, outside and the ground plane the, the shield leave the center conductor wrap it around your copper wire so you get a little bit of strength solder that on then you can use a piece of plastic or uh, anything you can find to stiffen it up here so there's some plastic there's some uh, heat shrink and duct tape good old duct tape holding all together here and so you want to make that about 19 um, inches and, and lengthen these out about 19 inches all from the ground and you don't measure from the down part down here but from where the actual bare center conductor begins okay It does work very good, and what also works very good without the ground, you can stick that right on your handy talkie, and it works pretty good too. A lot better than the attenuators. So it's very flexible. All right, thank you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, don't go anywhere. There you are. Thank you. Okay, are there any, is there anybody else who has a homebrew project that has not gotten a chance to show it? Come on down. Actually, I just want the torch. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Dan, uh, calls N7NKR. Uh, I don't think too many people know me. I, I was kind of active earlier in the club about six years ago, and then I went off to college. And then now I'm back. Anyway, uh, when I was up in college, I went to Utah State, and I was living in the dorms up there. It was about a seven-foot or seven-story uh, building. I meant to bring this thing down, but it, I didn't. But anyway, uh, needed to get an HF antenna somewhere. But in their infinite wisdom, they wanted to make the wind jump out of them if you were going to commit suicide. So they only opened up about that far. If you're going to commit suicide, you go through the window. And then they had they had. Uh, uh, bars across, uh, across the window just enough to where they opened up. So you had about seven four-inch bars that way all the way down the window. Hang clothes on it, things like that. So I had 
uh, three fairing strips that I'd gotten, one by two fairing strips, I believe, and bolted them all together to go out this window. And on the end of it was a slinky <laughs> with a fish, piece of fishing line attached to the very bottom of it and then a bunch of uh, fishing weight on the, on the uh, very bottom of the slinky. Run the uh, fishing line back in, get a, uh, a, uh, a seawater uh, fishing reel that I had, the old uh, uh, spinner type reel. Uh, you don't see them too much anymore. But I, I could have that because I could lock it in one, direct, in one position. So I just kind of poked my head out the window and released the bale and watched the slinky go down. And yeah, there's about 40 meters. <laughs> <laughs> And it, and it worked. It worked fairly well. And for weight to counterbalance the thing so it didn't go sliding up my window, I went dumpster diving one night back in the, the uh, grocery store and got about seven or eight milk jugs, filled them with water, and then just tied it, and then moved my dresser over, had the thing lay, laying on the, on the dresser going out the window with the milk jugs hanging on the back end. The girl I was dating did evidently marry me. Don't know why. <laughs> And it, it worked fairly well. It wasn't the best thing, but every time I went uh, went out, I tried to leave it out, uh, you know, see if I can find people's reactions to the thing. But anyway, that's that's it. Thank you. Here, I'll give you a, a clue, but the things it could be. Oh, he's got a bucket. <laughs>